Hey, this week we're talking about ARM dev kits that got canceled, ARM on Linux, and the new four ARM Raspberry Pi NVMe. Then there is the Colonel Russia and the Department of Treasury. Boy, that's quite the story. At Malabal, we talk about Pipewire, OBS, Alma Linux, all kinds of fun stuff. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is the Untitled Linux Show, episode 175, recorded Saturday, October the 26th. Jack the Threadripper. Hey folks, it is Saturday, and you know what that means. It's time to get geeky with Linux and open source and software and hardware and gaming and pretty much whatever else strikes our fancy. It's just that kind of show. It's the Untitled Linux Show, and of course, it's not just me. We've got Rob, we've got Ken, and we've got a set of at least nine stories and three command line tips. We're assuming they're all going to be command line tips today. We, uh, well, they're not always command line tips, but that's all right. And we're going to let Rob kick us off. And we're going to talk about the Snapdragon. Now, the big news this week, I don't know if this is what Rob was talking about, but like the Snapdragon dev kit got canceled. Is that related to this, Rob? No. Um, <laughs> that was, I believe that was the Windows Snapdragon dev kit that got canceled. It's at least but. partially related to this. Like there's going to be some, some overlap between those two things. But uh, dive into it, and then we'll we'll talk about that overlap and maybe what all this means. Yeah, so I mean, this isn't from this week. This is actually a story from the week before, because I miss one day, and these guys let the biggest news story of last week just slip right on by. And, well, for those that follow me on Mastodon, even though it is a week old, I promised I would keep you up to date on the news that these lovely folks seem to have missed while I wasn't here. Or maybe they just saved it for me because they knew how excited I would be for this. Oh yeah. Uh, this is this is a good news thing. I, I don't know about the the dev kit being canceled if that's good or bad or maybe just neutral for us probably being Linuxy. But here on the Untitled Linux show, we, or maybe it's just myself, I have been excitedly watching the progress of Qualcomm that they've been making on their new Snapdragon x processors hyped to be the Apple Silicon Killers. We were we were all a little disappointed when these devices came out with Windows only on them first, but we knew Linux would be coming to them soon, at least. You know, we hoped it would be coming soon and and not the relatively slow battle slog that slog uh, what maybe I don't, I don't know what word I was looking for there uh, that the Asahi folks had to endure <laughs> with the Apple M1 M2 <laughs> silicon. I mean, they got it going eventually, but, you know, Apple sure wasn't any help to them. But thanks to the folks at Qualcomm being better stewards of their hardware than Apple, most of the elements of the Snapdragon X180 SOC at system on a chip support is already upstream into the Linux kernel. And in Linux 6.11, uh, 6.12, we have seen various device tree files added for different Snapdragon X, um, X180 laptops. So now it's just up to the distros to put out their releases and 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 this that the week I take a break from the show is the week that Canonical did just that by releasing a developer preview of Ubuntu 24.10 with plans to provide an installation image that will quote just work on as many Snapdragon X1 Elite systems as possible. There are various feature limitations that remain. Like firmware still cannot be <laughs> easily redistributed by Ubuntu or other Linux distributions until they have been released or relicensed, I guess. So now users need to jump through hoops of having to fetch the firmware files from their Microsoft Windows installation for use under Linux. But eh, just be like the old days where nobody ever updated firmware anyway. Why not? But <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, I joke there, 
kind of. But if, if you're looking, if you are looking to test things out yourself, the best experience will likely be with the Lenovo ThinkPad T14's Gen 6, as this has been the devices uh, we've seen the most testing by Canonical. And a quick look on the Le Lenovo site shows you can get them for as low as right around $1,200. Uh, us dollars um they had like three SKUs on there the top one started at 2600 us dollars so exciting feature but for that cost i may settle for an m1 m2 apple to put on linux for now but if if you'd like to see me in one of these nice ah. lenovos <laughs> all it'll take is a low price of 240 coffee donations and i'll be able to afford one and maybe Jonathan has some news coming up here too that uh, that I didn't quite catch this week, but he hinted at it a little before the show, and and may maybe that'll be a way to get me into one. Uh, we'll find out what what's said on that. Yeah. So what's real fascinating here is obviously these 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 ARM based AI chips. They're kind of there for a while. It was the new thing for Windows 11. Like that was that was what was coming down the pike. And then we got the news this week that the Snapdragon X Elite Dev Kit is canceled. Pulled the plug on it. No longer going to happen. Refunding people's money and everything. And so there's even a there's a story in Pharonix about the kernel devs because apparently some of them already had their hands on this thing. And it's like, what do we do now? We'd already started porting it. <laughs> so they decided, eh, essentially, yeah, it's good practice. Let's go ahead and port it and make it work. <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious well, aren't there already aren't they already uh there's already laptops out there with that is this for a specific piece of hardware that's just for like a specific uh qualcomm piece that was like their their nook equivalent right isn't that what it was it's it's a the dev board hash patches yeah. for the x1e001 de snapdragon dev kit for windows mm -hmm. so yeah. i mean it's not the end of the world. It's one piece of hardware. It, yes, but I, I suppose I'm trying to read the tea leaves here. And like, why? Why did Qualcomm suddenly cancel their Windows dev kit for their Snapdragon chip? And like, that is interesting. It, does that signal that Microsoft is moving, taking a step back from ARM? Or are we suddenly going to see a whole bunch of these ARM devices that either get canceled or get abandoned? I've, or, it's... Or, or or it's something they do the same thing Apple did to get around the FCC guidelines with their Apple II when they came out with the Apple computer. Well, <laughs> what's here, that? What's that, Ken? What did Apple do? Well, they had somebody else build the uh, video uh, connection to go to the TV, the mon the mm -hmm. uh, modulator, and you they sold that separately. So each could get around the FCC because it fell on the end user to take put up with any uh, interference. I gotcha. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I doubt it's quite that sort of a deal, but I, I don't know. They just it strikes me as being very weird that they're they're pulling the plug on it. Rob, what do you think? So here's my tea leave. I mean, they already have Windows laptops out there um, running on this. Uh, it, I I think I think this was like their specific like their their little Mac Mini uh, equivalent mm -hmm. their Snapdragon X Lite Dev Kit being an eight hundred and ninety nine US dollar Mini PC. I think this was just their Mac Mini equivalent and or maybe their what is that called where they make something so other people can kind of copy it. There like a reference implementation. Reference. I think it so, may have something to do with ARM. So well, here, here's what the I company, think. Company, as far as <laughs> things are licensing it to, yeah, Qualcomm. things are potentially changing with ARM too. That's true. I mean, if this is 899 US dollars, you can get a Mac Mini for uh, as low as 599 US dollars, 799 for a, a bigger one. So it's it's not really competitive from that perspective. Uh, if you want an ARM little ARM PC, I mean, you got. Not as powerful, but you got the Raspberry Pi fives, which yeah, okay. So, but Rob, you're thinking of this from from a consumer standpoint. I'm thinking of this from a business standpoint. If you've got a dev kit 
So your dev kit is, okay, this is essentially the hardware. This is the chip that we're going to ship. Here's the dev kit you buy so that all of these different companies can do development work for supporting this chip inside of Windows. And when you then say, never mind, we're not going to ship a dev kit, that that is well, a that is a huge that that is communicating a huge posture change, like a huge change of priorities. And so I just I just have questions. Or now. there's already half a dozen um, devices out there running this that they can use that they can easily just develop on anyway. That why do they need another board when there's already a whole bunch of other ones out there? Because dev kits tend to have extra debugging ports on them that laptops don't. That's usually what makes something a dev kit. It's also not a laptop, and you don't necessarily need or even want a laptop form factor to do development work. Uh, it just it just strikes me as being really, really odd. And it makes me think that somebody somewhere put the brakes on. And so we may see less arm on Windows going forwards than we expected to. That's your that is, prediction. That is my take on this. My prediction is it it doesn't mean much of anything. Though I also read the Linux one plans to keep right on going or whatever the Linux port of it. I, I, bear, I didn't read this much, but I skimmed. I saw it out there. I ain't going too deep. Yeah, the, the the kernel guys basically said, "All right, we've got it in hand. We'll go ahead and keep working on it." So uh, that is the Snapdragon Elite, and there is actually something else in the news about Linux on ARM and ARM desktops, and that is that System seventy six is just released the Thelio Astra. Now they're calling it an official desktop for. This is weird to me. Streamline autonomous vehicle development. That's that's just an odd thing to say about this, but it's powered. So it's powered by Ampere. And so it is a native ARM64 desktop. So like this has way more power than a Raspberry Pi 5. It's got, uh, let's see. So you could put you could put up to 512 gigs of DDR4 into it. Um, it's got M.2 slots. It's got PCIe Gen 4. Um, and it's it's literally an NVIDIA Ampere Ultra in a desktop form factor. So I'm, I, I don't see immediately how many cores that is, but it's quite a, it's quite a few. It's like, I, I want to say 32 or 64 cores. Uh, it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so this is sort of the opposite extreme, whereas Qualcomm is dropping things. <laughs> You've got System76 that's picking up like this really exciting new thing. And... They are, like I said, they're pitching it as really good for doing development for autonomous driving platforms. And I'm sure that there are companies that will do that. Um, but this thing is going to be great just for doing ARM development, for doing uh, ARM compiling. So, you know, mm, if you need yeah. to do a, a bunch of recompiling for ARM, this is going to be one of the places where you can actually do it natively, which there are some big advantages for doing it natively. Um, so... I, I have worries about ARM on the desktop, but at the same time, System76 is saying, we're all in. We did it. Here it is. ARM on the desktop. Go for it. Although this is more of a workstation than a desktop, but still, here it uh, is. Unless, I mean, from a personal user perspective, unless it's Qualcomm Snapdragon X Elite is going to outperform Intel uh, in power. Uh, kind of like the Mac has outperformed their old Intel-based chips. Un mm -hmm. Unless they do that, from an end-user perspective, I'm not too interested in it. But, I mean, I can... The the, the great use case for it, you know, for a desktop, mm -hmm. the great use case, though, as, as you said, is being able to develop on ARM because, you know, I mean, obviously, it's going to speed it up if you can pack the power on it. But from a desktop... From an end user perspective, I, I don't care too much about um, about power usage. I just want I just right. want the thing to be powerful. From a laptop, I, I, I you know give me give me the best of both both worlds that you can. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if if you're developing an ARM, that seems like a great option to speed up your development workflow. And so the Ampere Ultra is 128 cores of uh, ARM 64 goodness. That I'd be is. curious to see how that uh, that actually benchmarks against Intel, though. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that would be super interesting. I think I think Gearling 
Gearling talked about one of these. Uh, he may have one. Um, let's see. I, I know he has a video about this because he's he's all about the uh, or he may have a video, but a post. Anyway, he is all about the whole let's put expensive video cards on ridiculous arm hardware. And that's just been his thing for a while. Uh, as soon as there was a PCI Express lane in the Raspberry Pi that you could you could feasibly get to. Um, so, yeah, I, I expect to see him trying to get a hold of this and uh, playing with it. Uh, is this for sale yet? It. I found I, it, but I don't see uh, a way to buy it. Uh, probably not yet from yeah. the looks of it. Not until the 12th of September. That's when shipments start. There you go. I'm Coming sure it's going to be a lot of coffees. So, oh yeah. yeah. Or a nice <laughs> Christmas gift for somebody. <laughs> hey, you know, I have received some actual physical gifts from, uh, a fan out there. I haven't <laughs> shared them all on the show, but, uh, you, you know what fan, um, this would be awesome. <laughs> uh, not that it. your other, not that your other gifts weren't uh, humorously awesome, but uh, yeah, this would be cool. <laughs> Give him an inch, and he takes. He wants a ruler. He wants to be a ruler. Give him an inch, and he wants to be a ruler. Oh my goodness! Uh, Pharonix does have an article where they where where Michael has uh, gone through and benchmarked this. Uh, it looks like just against the the two system seventy six. Um, Oh, so it gets a 7980X, which that's a that's what a Threadripper, I think. Yeah. So he did. He benchmarked it against a, a Threadripper. So I've got the link. I threw the link there in the uh, show notes. And you can go and take a look at that. It looks like the Threadripper is, generally speaking, about twice as fast. Um, but in quite a few of these, they're pretty close. So, and I imagine once you get to uh, performance per watt, yeah, the the Threadripper is like double the speed, but the the CPU the the power consumption is quite a bit better on the uh, the ARM based machine. So interesting stuff there. All right, uh, Ken, do you want to talk about PipeWire? I want to talk a lot about PipeWire, <laughs> especially since Bobby Borisov reported on updates to the PipeWire one point two point X and the 1.0.x series this week. First is the release of PipeWire.1.2.6 with a bug fix update that maintains API and ABI compatibility with all previous 1.2.x and 1.0.x versions. It addresses several key issues. One involves the filter chain module. We're fixing the bug results in more consistent behavior when managing audio effects. Users will not, um, notice improved responsiveness when interacting with audio streams now that stream states are based on the underlying node state. Another improvement in Pipewire 1.2.6 concerns exporting nodes, which now have their state changes handled synchronously. This modification allows the server to immediately start the driver, reducing the likelihood of initial X runs or buffer underruns, which can cause audio glitches. Jonathan knows well about that. Mm -hmm. Stream flush handling has been enhanced, ensuring more efficient data processing during playback and recording. Also fixed is an issue in which mixed information was sent to destroyed ports, resulting in errors within Jack clients. This change minimizes unnecessary errors, particularly in complex audio setups connected by multiple clients. Now, Bobby also wrote about another bug fix update to just the 1.0.x series under Pipewire version 1.0.9. It addresses several key bugs fix fixes, including the fix for a file descriptor leak and protocol confusion, which previously could lead to resource leaks and incorrect memory usage. It also uh, corrected a bug affecting the audio mixer synchronization after port selection has been resolved, sometimes leaving users with muted audio. And issues related to FD leaks and protocol inconsistencies were fixed, 
contributing to a smoother overall user experience. And last of the ones I'm going to mention is a fix for a use after free issue in the real time module when stopping a thread. As I've only covered some of the changes in both of these updates, I do recommend reading both of Bobby's articles if you do want more information. I also recommend rating for updates from your distribution since they will have better integration with your system, unless you like playing with uh, compiling uh, <laughs> programming and libraries yourself. I have compiled Pipewire and installed it, and it's actually not too terrible. Um, you know, some of those system libraries are a pain to get working, but Pipewire is not too bad. Um, and my command line tip later is going to help you find out which version you do have. There you go. Yeah, I uh, Pipewire has come along such a long ways in the past couple of years. It's it's really it's really turned into quite the quite the good solution for for most most things. Um, there are there are a few cases where people still need to run Jack or you know something doesn't work in it. But or for false audio, all, yeah, I I mean it. I can't. I, I don't know of any case where Pulse Audio works better than Pipewire at this point. Uh, honestly, uh, unless it's for uh, legacy applications, maybe. Mm -mm. That's why Pipewire is so cool. When they wrote Pipewire, they said, all right, we're just going to take the Pulse Audio API and we're going to re-implement it directly in Pipewire. And we're going to take also the Jack API and we're going to re-implement directly in Pipewire. So any program that was built for Pulse Audio can just talk to Pipewire kind of natively and, and it just works. Mm -hmm. And any program built for Jack can just talk natively to Pipewire and it just works. Now, Jack is complicated and hairy and you're talking about you know very tight timing tolerances. So there's been a lot of work that's had to be put into that, a lot of bug fixes over the years to make things actually work. Now um, you're talking about into Jack. In Jack. Well as <laughs> so, yeah, so programs that were written for Jack, that's things like Ardor, um, to make those programs work kind of seamlessly with Pipewire, that has been a, a big lift. Because you were doing things in Jack, like in Ardor, when you went to render something out, it would put Jack into freewheeling mode, where it just sort of ignored the, the clock on the wall, and we just chug through the audio as fast as possible and so they had to re-implement that in pipewire to to be able to do this to 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 put pipewire in this state because jack would actually your our door would actually use the jack back in to process the audio still and so they had to come up with a way to say okay we're going to take part of the pipewire engine and we're going to also put it into freewheeling mode so that we can chug through all this audio super fast to be able to render a, a, a session out um, lots still, lots and lots of complicated things there and still, even if it was Pulse, Pulse Audio or Jack, you still had to get Alsa involved. Yes. Yeah, Pulse Audio, Jack. Pipewire as well still runs on top of Alsa. Alsa is basically your, your Linux kernel drivers for audio, um, whereas Pipewire sits on top of that, and it's the, the thing that routes everything around. Um, they, they have, in the past year or so, um, they did add the ability to talk to Firewire drivers. And in Pipewire. Um, last what I checked, that still didn't work very well. I need to go back and check that again, actually. Um, but I guess in that case, it would not talk with ALSA. It would talk with, uh, is that FFADO? No. FFADO yeah. is the one that's... Yeah, I think it was. I think it's what they implemented. The ability to talk one of us covered to... that when it came out. Yeah. I, I did. I tried it. And like I said, back then, it didn't work very well. I think, I think the community actually sent uh, Wim Taman's some firewire hardware and it's like look your code looks beautiful it doesn't actually work have some real hardware to test it on <laughs> oh my goodness that's helpful uh, you didn't volunteer some of your hardware did you? no because i only have one and i really don't want to get rid of it it's pretty nice audio hardware from back in the day oh okay rob let's talk oh rob let's talk about bitwarden i don't know much about this story yet i've i've seen the headline what what is bitwarden doing so over the past week or so, there have been some concerns in the open source communities. And I believe I saw it first on Reddit. Of course, that's where all this <laughs> stuff comes first. Um, that Bitwarden is beginning to move away from open source. So, you know, my first rant is they better not. This is a big reason why we love them. I, I am even a paid subscriber. Uh, that I love them so much. But if you betray us, Bitwarden, 
we'll leave you faster than we left last pass when they betrayed us. So that's my warning. Uh, but so what, what happened here is a, a week or two ago, users began to notice the client introduced a quote Bitwarden slash SDK internal dependency and that internal SDK having a license clause that stipulated, quote, here it is, you may not use this SDK to develop applications for use with software other than Bitwarden, including non-compatible implementations of Bitwarden, or to develop another SDK. So this was raised as an issue in, in their GitHub as it essentially makes the Bitwarden client no longer free and open. Uh, the comments were flying around on Reddit uh, until Bitwarden founder and CTO Kyle Spearin made a comment about the situation on GitHub saying, I'm just going to read his quote here. We have made some adjustments to how the SDK code is organized and packaged to allow you to build and run the app. I mean, actually, I'm going to back up. First, there was a quick comment about it being a bug. Later on, uh, just a few days ago, I think, or very recently, this quote was there. So it says af after th that issue, um, they've made changes to allow you to build and run the app with only GPL slash OSI licenses included. The SDK internal package references in this client now come from a new SDK internal repository, which follows the licensing model we have historically used for all of our clients. The SDK internal reference only uses GPL licenses at this time. If the reference were to include Bitwarden license code in the future, we will provide a way to produce multiple build variants of the client, similar to what we do with Web Vault client builds. Uh, the original SDK repository will be renamed to SDK Secrets and retain its existing Bitwarden SDK license structure for the secret manager business projects. The SDK secrets repository and packages will no longer be referenced from the client app since that code is not used there. So they're essentially saying the inability uh, to compile the free client because of that uh, non GPL compliant license code that was showing up in there, that was essentially a bug. And they plan to fix it and apparently now have fixed it, um, you know, but there is going to be closed source code available. It sounds like in the regular client that most people will just be downloading and using, uh, at least if you just uh, download their pre-compiled stuff, whichever operating system you use. From what I read, this isn't anything, you know, it's not anything malicious, but rather an attempt to add more features to the client that they, I guess, apparently haven't been able to add with their own free code or for some reason wanted to make these extra features that they're building closed. Um, you know, I believe I can accept this answer as long as there is a free option available. You know, maybe I don't like it too much, but you know, don't push it, Bitwarden. I don't want to <laughs> have to take my subscription fee and, and find another client. I, I've been enjoying you too much. Um, just the way you are. <laughs> Cue the Billy Joel song. <laughs> don't go change in. <laughs> um, I, I honestly, I totally buy their explanation. It is extremely challenging to run a business using GPL code and try to thread the needle of, you know, what value adds can we give and still respect the GPL? And something like this accidentally leaking out with the wrong license, and then as soon as it was pointed out, they fixed it. I mean, that, that sounds like they did the right thing in the end. Uh, I, I would not attribute this to any sort of maliciousness. Um, now, obviously keep an eye on them. If they try to do something like this in the future, well, then maybe we begin to, to rethink that. Um, but at this point, this just this seems like an, an accident where they're they're working on things for internal code, um, and some of their internal code is not ever intended to be external. It's not ever intended to be used under the GPL. So they've got this other license that they use internally. 
and the streams accidentally crossed. That that sort of thing happens. I definitely yeah. don't want to cross the stream. Don't cross the streams. Not in this case. As, as long as they're not going to do something like freeze the free freeze the features on the free version, which I guess I'm fine with. I'm happy with the features. I don't I don't know what else I need. But mm. you know they could freeze a feature and say, well, all new features are going into our paid product, our closed source. Which I did that once about 10, 15 <laughs> years ago with the program I worked. I I I, uh, I made, but uh, and it did so well for you. I, I made about a thousand dollars a year off of it for several oh, years. Nice uh, for a nine ninety five dollar one time fee. So not too bad. Yeah. So I guess <laughs> the um, the question there with that idea is. <sighs> Is there other GPL code from people outside of Bitwarden, or do they have a uh, um, a license agreement? You know, is there a um, contributor license agreement where people have to assign the copyright to Bitwarden? I guess if if that's the case, then they can change it if they want to. Um, I know, like the, I the the main feature I paid for is the free one doesn't have the OTP the uh, the the MFA in mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. but if you pay for it you get that and yeah it's, it's kind of nice having that right there yeah that's fair so kyra makes a point here that bidwarden would be forked so fast if they went private for essential features yeah that's part of the point of using the gpl is and if, they've already got a competitor in keypass xc as far as uh that. yeah not as good but no bit bidwarden <laughs> is kind of the premier password manager right now like standalone password manager at this point isn't it well, especially yeah. if you're wanting one that lets you have multiple devices synced without setting up your own uh, cloud service but what's great is you can set up your own server if you want everything to be in your own vault yeah Okay, we do need to mention, <laughs> this is fairly important, uh, Bitwarden is actually a sponsor of Twit. I didn't, uh, Oh, yeah. we were not thinking about that. I did not know that for sure until I just went and looked. Um, but you I know, knew that at one time, I forgot. I was actually going to say. Full, full disclosure, Bitwarden is a sponsor of Twit, but obviously that, you know, was not a, uh, <laughs> was not a, uh, you a contributing factor. We did not take that into I, consideration while indeed. discussing this. I went from LastPass to Bitwarden while Twit was still, I think, advertising LastPass, or maybe they want, but it was definitely mm -hmm. before Twit started advertising, or before I guess before Bitwarden started sponsoring uh, anything on Twit. So I went to him first, um, but you know, LastPass used to be the premier mm -hmm. and used to also be a sponsor of Twit. Mm -hmm. um, they betrayed us all in several ways, several <laughs> times. Um, if you don't know, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll tell you. I, we, we don't have time to go through the, all this on the show, but well, that's when I went to Bitwarden. And then, you know, Twit was smart and, and, and they got them as a sponsor shortly after. <laughs> yep. All right. So I've got two stories here uh, and they are both... They are both these kind of stories that, you know, it's like, guys, this is not what I want to be talking about. I, I would I would like to talk about the positive things of open source, but no, no, we've got feuds and fights and fussing and all sorts of stuff. And uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is the shakeup among the kernel maintainers. You may or may not be aware of this, but within the past, uh, I think it's within the past week, um, a, a change landed in the Linux kernel. and. A, a couple of dozen, one or two dozen maintainers were sort of quietly removed from their maintainership. And the thing that they all had in common was they basically all had a .ru email address. Um, they, they were all Russians. And they... So the, the, the first thing is you may be surprised, actually. Like, this is something we should mention. You may be surprised that, wait, there were Russians that were maintainers in the Linux kernel? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, there were. Um, and some of these people, in fact, all of the ones that were removed were employed by or affiliated with uh, a handful of Russian companies, like Baikal being one of them, um, who makes little ARM-based CPUs, but Baikal products end up in drones and missiles and things used by the Russian military. 
and they was you know so long as they write good code nobody particularly cared that they were in the kernel there there've been there have been some minor things in the past where i think i think one a, a maintainer from ukraine opted to not take a pull request from a maintainer that was um employed by bycall for potentially obvious reasons um so there've been a couple of things that have happened but they just they just quietly yanked all these people from being maintainerships, and there was a little bit of an uproar. Um, and finally, we got we got some clarity on this. And so, one of the core kernel maintainers came out and said, "Look, the Linux Foundation lawyers gave us this, these guidelines." They said, "Okay, we finally got it cleared that we can tell you exactly what they said." And it was. If your company is on the U.S. OFAC SDN list, subject to OFAC sanctions program. So essentially, the U.S. government puts out these are the companies that are sanctioned for one reason or another. Uh, or owned or controlled by a company on that list, our ability to collaborate you will be subject to restrictions and you cannot be on the maintainer's file. So the, the lawyers at the Linux Foundation came to the conclusion very recently that anyone that we suspect is being, you know, either uh, employed by or collaborating with one of these sanctioned companies they just they can't be on the maintainer's file it's it's a it's a problem we can't do it legally we cannot do it so like and and that's fairly understandable because the linux foundation is based in the united states uh linus Torvalds and greg kh the two at the real at the top of the they're both u.s uh greg is a u.s citizen for sure i i don't know off the top of my head if Torvalds is an actually citizen or just long-term resident but he resides in the united states regardless um and so like on one hand well that's that's fairly understandable um but then on the other hand, there, there were some questions that people had. And one of them was like, what about Huawei? Uh, what, what about the Chinese sanctioned companies that are still, you know, part of the Linux kernel development team? <laughs> and I thought that was a, a really valid question. Uh, Ted So, one of the other kernel maintainers, high level guy, came out, spoke out and said, hey, just so you know, there are different rules and regulations within these sanctions. And while there is there is an exception in place for these Chinese companies, that exception is not in place for the Russian companies. Okay, again, that's understandable. Uh, people were annoyed that this was done suddenly without much communication, um, but it is what it is. All right, so that that's 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 part of this. And then there was a statement from James Bottomley, again, a core kernel maintainer, who obviously was part of the discussion with the lawyers about this. And here's what he said. And this is the part that's important. He said, we are hoping that this action alone will be sufficient to satisfy the U.S. Treasury Department in charge of sanctions. And we, we won't also have to remove any existing patches. And when I read that, my, my head exploded. Because this says to me, someone from the U.S. Treasury Department contacted the Linux Foundation and said, hey, not only do you have members of these sanctioned companies in your maintainer's file, which is a fair, that, that in and of itself is a fairly legitimate thing to do. It's just, it's just, these are the sanctions. These are the laws. So there's that. Like, that's fairly reasonable to me. But this statement implies that there was a threat that you would also have to remove the code that these people had written. And that is a problem. And I will tell you that is a problem because in the United States, code is protected speech. This has been established several times in court cases. Code is First Amendment protected speech. And the idea that the government can come in and say, you're not allowed to say this because it was first said by someone that we disapprove of is a huge First Amendment violation and a huge problem. So this, we are now past the whole Russian-China sanctions issue, and we're now on to what is the U.S. government allowed to do when it comes to things like the Linux kernel and other software pro projects? I, 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 see a, I see a huge disconnect between these two. It's, it's two separate issues. Um, you can, you know, you could say, I, I really don't want Russians or people associated with these Russian companies and in the maintainer's file. Like that, that's fine. That's a discussion to have. That's fine. 
But to say the U.S. government gets to come along and say you're not allowed to put this into your source code, which is protected speech. Yeah, I think that's just entirely beyond the pale. And I have I've literally already called on the Linux Foundation to to launch a lawsuit against the U.S. government because I consider this to be entirely unreasonable and illegal. Um, and this sort of a precedent cannot stand. Uh, we will all be in trouble if the government can come along and say, nope, we don't like that code. You're not allowed to put it into your open source project. Um, so that is my take on it. I am, I am, I am beside myself over this. It's a good uh, thing you get that take. I know where you can find some real good lawyers that will help you. The Linux Foundation already has really good lawyers. Um, I, just so you know, I've sent, I've sent an email directly to Greg. I have contact information. I've been in contact with him before. Um, and I, man, I, I am unhappy and worried over this. It strikes me as being a terrible thing. So we'll see what happens. The, the, they don't know that they have to take anything out. They are. So the, the exact statement is that they are hoping that this action alone, removing them as maintainers, will be enough to sufficiently satisfy the U.S. Treasury Department that is in charge of sanctions. So they're hoping that the action they have taken is enough to satisfy them. They are therefore hoping that they won't have to remove any existing patches. So, I mean, just stop and think about that, though. If the U.S. government said, okay, you've got to remove any patches in the Linux kernel that any of these people associated with these companies have written back to the beginning of when the sanctions happened, I guess. Like, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. Who, I mean, what if they said... Break? <laughs> no, it would break everything. That's the thing. You cannot just remove the patches. That that's not so. Uh, the f friend of mine, who's a fellow developer, we were talking about this, and he says you would basically just have to roll the entire source tree back to when the sanction started, and mm -hmm. then start over from there. Which uh, the government, being a a user of Linux, seems like it could be rough for them too. But um, I I wonder maybe like, that's part of their concern going forward but if it's all good now but i wonder you know linux i mean linux isn't like a business per se i don't know how the organizational unit um holds for like linux itself so i, I i'm mm -hmm. curious how what kind of enforcement could actually be done like who would be responsible or what to entity or, or or is somebody concerned about what recently happened uh, earlier this year possibly happening with the linux kernel the x the xz hack yeah so i that may be what someone is concerned about that is a ridiculous concern to have in this context because if someone was going to do that they would not do it from a dot ru email address they would do it from a dot gmail address they would say hi my name is john smith and I live in the middle of the United States, and here's my patch to make things better. Um, yeah, yeah, what if they just said no? I mean, what's... I, I, so, okay, so the Linux Foundation is a trade, trade organization. So it is a... Um, it is not a nonprofit. It is a... I think trade organization is actually what they call it. But they don't but, control Linux either. No, but they pay the... They, they have a lot of money, okay. and they pay the salary of Torvalds and Greg KH and some of the other core maintainers mm, like I there is a, there's a there's a pot of money there that you could at least go after for fines um i, don't, I mean i'm just curious how that could all, could all play out i mean if if they just said no <laughs> like if there's a way that could play out you know uh, he goes back to uh to his home country and just runs it from there gets some <laughs> other sponsor to pay him and it's like what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I okay. So part of the problem is some of these sanctions are, I can, I guess the best, only way I can think of to put it is copied by some of the other countries. There are sanctions uh, in countries around the world. And one other, one other point to this is uh, Torvalds in typical Torvalds fashion, you know, sped it off on the kernel mailing list. And uh, he basically said, look, guys, I'm from Finland. There's no love lost between me and the Russians. 
<laughs> Which is like, okay, that's fine. Um, there, there was one thing he said that I was, I was honestly a little disappointed by. Um, and I may be wrong here, but I will just tell you my thoughts on it. He, he, there has been pushback and Torvalds mentioned the tush pushback and he said it's, you know, it's obvious that the Russian troll farms are out in force because there's so many people that have replied to this. And I have seen this, I've seen this pattern a few times now. We saw it with, with Godot and now we're seeing it with Torvalds that when a company or a person makes a questionable decision that is unpopular in certain places and the obvious thing happens that a lot of people reach out to them to tell you to tell them that it's an unpopular decision and they don't approve of it. They immediately jump to, oh, it's bots. It's Russian bots. It's like, maybe it's not Russian bots. and Maybe there's just enough of us out here that are annoyed by the decision you made. We think you handled this poorly. I, I'm, I'm a little over the whole, let's jump straight to, it's Russian bots every time. Because I don't think it's all Russian bots, and I don't think it's always well, Russian bots. Sometimes it's American bots. Sometimes it's real American well, people that are annoyed. Malaysian and whatever else. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, that's my piece. I have, I have spoken my piece on that matter. And uh, we're going to move on to something else. Uh, Ken is going to tell us about OBS and a new versioning system. Yes, I am. And I'm going to thank Bobby uh, Borisov for reporting on the latest news from OBS this week. The team has decided to change the version numbering scheme used. They started following proper semantic versioning to bring more clarity. Starting now, OBS will follow a major.minor.patch format, uh, like, say, uh, 30.0.2. Now, here's an explanation for uh, those that may not understand the semantic scheming. The major number introduces big breaking changes that might require users or to developer or developers to adapt to these changes. The minor number indicates adding new features or improvements without actually breaking anything, hopefully. The patch number will include bug fixes or other small tweaks that need immediate attention. Uh, security uh, patch, anyone? <laughs> and then according to the official OBS Studio announcement by, and I don't know his real name, just his username that he used, uh, WarChamp7, we didn't have a strict structure or consistency in deciding when to release a new version or how to label it. Releases would come when we felt there were enough new features or fixes to warrant one, and we'd assign a version number based on how significant we thought the changes were. Sometimes a major version would include breaking changes, and other times it was simply a feature-packed release we wanted to highlight. This inconsistency <coughs> could be confusing and moving forward, We've committed to using major version numbers strictly for updates that fundamentally change how you use OBS or affect developers by modifying the API or dependencies. A great example of why this change was needed is OBS 28.0. That release included an update to the user interface framework we use, which broke compatibility with several plugins. Jonathan, do you remember that? I don't, actually. Now, in hindsight, our inconsistent use of major version bumps mu muddied the significance of this update, causing frustration among both users and developers. By sticking more closely to semantic versioning, we hope to avoid these kinds of issues in the future. Uh, that's the end of the quote from WarChamp7. I'm sure Jonathan could probably provide several more examples of a that took time to think about that. <laughs> yeah, it's neat to see actual semantic versioning here. Um, How was it before? Whatever we feel like versioning. Oh. I can't tell you how many times I've I've been in projects. So, um, I I I think it was in the chat room. I mentioned mentioned Mesh Tastic. So uh, we use Platform IO, which we compile in Visual Studio Code most of the time. And it it does this thing automatically where you say, you know, I want to use 
uh, this library and this version number, but you can put a special character in there. I think it's a caret right before the version number. And it, so that's saying this version number or any later non-breaking change, which so in this case, that's the dot patch. So you could say, okay, so if I'm running 30.0.1 and 30.0.2 comes out, just automatically next time I compile it, go out and grab that. And I cannot tell you how many times compilation has broken because of that. Like all the time compilation breaks because of that. It's ridiculous. Um, so all that to say, yay for properly actually doing semantic versioning where you can do a patch update and be pretty, uh, pretty confident that things are not going to just break all over the place. Yeah, they didn't change their sequencing. They just did the major minor. Now it looks like I was looking through their versioning. So it was like, now, yeah. just going forward, uh, in fact, I'm running OBS uh, 30.0.2, even though they're getting ready to start working on 31. Hmm. Yep, yep. I, I'm a big fan of uh, of the versioning that has the years in it. Not enough. <laughs> yes, it, you can do it that way. Um, you can still do year, month, and do a major minor if you wanted. You could do like, so. Like what what some companies will do is they'll do year and then month, and that's essentially like th that is essentially their their major version. And then you, and then can you can do, do point releases. After you do point that. releases after that. Yeah, and that works too. I like that because you can quickly look at it and know like, okay, this is four years old. <laughs> it was like I don't know how long ago. I'm if I'm running version twenty nine of OBS, I don't know if if that. When did out. OBS 28 come out? I don't know. <laughs> I was just looking at all the versions. I should have looked at the dates. I closed that already. <laughs> the, the only thing I don't necessarily like about the uh, the, the year and month based, uh, particularly when, when a business, they do that. And then they also say, okay, so we have a yearly or a six month release cadence that goes along with it. And that is that not every major feature fits neatly into that release cadence and there is an advantage to saying okay this is the me next major feature and when we get it ready to go out that's going to be the next version bump um and so then you have like an idea of all right major feature version bump oh major feature version bump um as well, opposed just, to the however much of a version bump have have the bump the month be the version bump and then have point releases after that for miners uh, well, but when when a lot of these companies go to the year and the month, they are then on a six month cadence. Well, yeah. But they don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. No. But then your version. I, I guess the struggle the is if you have two major versions in the same month, but that doesn't happen. Month. Every once in a while. <laughs> Every once in a while, it doesn't happen. It doesn't have to happen. They can wait. They can wait a few <laughs> days for the next month. <laughs> All right, Rob, it is time for the Rob talks us all into spending money corner of the show. Now, this time I promised I, I, I wouldn't try to sell you, Jonathan, to buy anything after your wife donated me a cup of coffee. So now <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to work on Ken for a little bit. So what do we know about Ken? Well, we know he likes to stick to a budget, a.k.a. he's cheap and he likes Raspberry Pis and has even ran them as his main desktop computer before. So I have to find something that fits nicely into those categories. If, if he's going to run a Raspberry Pi as his desktop, he's going to want an M.2 SSD rather than the slow SD card uh, method that's been default for years. And fortunately, you know, using the M.2 on a Raspberry Pi isn't all that new. I mean, it's it's new with the Raspberry Pi 5, which has been out for some time now. Mm -hmm. But finding one that is 100% compatible and fits nicely on the smaller, you know, frame, the smaller box you're looking at that you want to fit that on, you know, you don't want a long stick sticking out there, could sometimes be a challenge. Or, or so I am reading. I, I haven't purchased a Pi 5 yet myself to try it out, but from what I'm reading, it can be a challenge, I guess. Well, Raspberry Pi Group is going to make it easy for you by selling a Raspberry Pi branded M.2 SSD. It comes in a nice small form factor, just a little short stick um, that fits nicely with your Pi. And it, 
comes with the options. You can either get a 256 gigabit for only 30 US dollars or a 512 gigabit for only 45 US dollars. Uh, you get, and with that, you get a guarantee that it, it's going to work with your Pi 5. And for the price that it competes with others that I found on sale online, I found some that were a few that were a little cheaper, but I'm not even sure I would trust those uh, ones that I found that were, I found some that were, uh, I don't know. You can't get too significant when you're only at thirty dollars. I think I found one like twenty one dollars, uh, but I'm not even sure I trust that. I trust the Pi branded one. <laughs> so, if you don't already have a Pi hat uh, for the M.2 drive, you can now also buy the new Raspberry Pi SSD kit, and that comes with one of those drives of the choice and an M.2 hat plus uh, with the SSD all in one. For only ten dollars more, so you know the other prices, it's forty dollars or fifty-five dollars. Uh, you know, it's it's been a few years since I've purchased a new Pi myself, and I think my newest might might actually be a three. But I really feel like it's it may be time to update my Pi gaming machine. Um, so, Ken, how is the availability these days for Raspberry Pis? <laughs> I haven't checked recently. But what I'm really interested in is the uh, MTOT2 hat and uh, M, uh, NVMe SSD kits. Yeah, the where they kit. both come together. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, there's a there's another kit that um, I don't remember who dropped it, but it's the it's the SSD and the PoE together. Um, uh, is that Pioria or Pi something like that? Um, Raspberry Pi's got an official kit out that they're bundling them. No, Wave WaveShare. Wave Looks like WaveShare is the ones that did it. Um, they were doing it before, yeah. They would offer to provide the uh, M.2 hat along with the SSD. Or maybe it's GeekPi. This link is off to GeekPi. Um, oh, there's there are several. There are several that are doing it, actually. Yeah, it's something like Pyori or I don't remember what it is. <laughs> is there are I, there are multiple companies that have put these out. Waveshare has one. GeekPi has one. Um, uh, Gearling has a video about this too. Uh, I thought it was just one that was doing it, but apparently there's there's five or six companies that have put these out. So that's uh, but, that's but now you can get it right from the company if you trust that Pi, you trust their hats and SSDs too. I don't think does Raspberry Pi have one that's both PoE and the uh, NVMe. Oh, the PoE. Um, yeah, that's that's what. No, I don't think so. No, yeah. no. This is just the SSD mm -hmm. with SSD. Yeah. Now it's cool that it's cool that Raspberry Pi officially has this. Um, but you know, it's pretty interesting that now you can do both, uh, and you can you can do it without having to do anything weird like stacking hats on top of each other. That's one of the other ways to go about this, and maybe wasn't ever the greatest. Um, so yeah, and this, but now there are there are options for doing this otherwise, um, and fairly reasonably. Like this wave share is only thirty two ninety nine, so it's always nice to have options. Oh, that would be! I should have brought it years ago. I I still have a Pi One, maybe it's a two, mm -hmm. uh, but I I gutted an old broken Nintendo. <laughs> I put it in there. I wired it up to the controllers, and then. And then I made little like USB adapters. So it looks like you're plugging it in like a USB to controller adapter into the into the Nintendo. Mm -hmm. and, and I tried to keep all the um, outlets and plugs as much best I could. Uh, obviously, I couldn't do anything with. The, well, I could have did something with the HDMI. I suppose I put it could have converted it, but I didn't. I just drilled a hole in the back for the HDMI. Maybe next time I'll convert it to, to RCA. I think that's what what's on there. But. um. Man, I don't know where I was. Oh, you know what? I guess that that uh, the PoE one would be cool because mm -hmm. I, I could like run this Nintendo. I mean, it looks like a Nintendo. Ah, uh -huh. PoE. <laughs> yeah, one cable, just just Ethernet. But that that kind of breaks away from the uh, somewhat realism I was trying to go for there. <laughs> it's like, hey, why there's no plug in here, or why isn't it plugged in and it's still powered up? Uh, magic. 
Get magic, yeah. <laughs> Batteries. <laughs> All right, I think it's my turn again, and uh, I've got uh, I've got another of these stories. Now this one is kind of more funny than anything else, but I've got another one of these stories that it's like what what is what is going on here? Um, and I saw this directly on uh, Twitter, actually on X is where I saw this, and then people have written about it since then. Um, but there is a company called Malabal. And they <laughs> they make laptops, apparently, and they wanted to um, it stands for modular, adaptable, long lasting innovations for business and leisure. Malabal. What a what a mouthful. Anyway, um, they recently put out a blog post called Don't Support the Core Boot Project because they wanted to they wanted to put core boot on their own laptops found it difficult, tried to work with the core boot team, and that didn't work out. And so now they have come out and uh, very publicly have attempted to shame the core boot team. And so I, I saw this, I saw this link and, you know, I thought, well, okay, that's kind of an inflammatory headline, but all right, whatever, I'll go, I'll go read through it. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm reading the, I'm reading their blog post. And, you know, they're talking about how that they have, they've had trouble working with the core boot team and there were problems. And so my, my immediate thought is, well, okay, sometimes open source projects are difficult to work with for various reasons. That's, that's fine. That's the fact of life. That happens sometimes. Sometimes developers are a little prickly and are difficult to work with. This is a real thing. This happens sometimes. So I, I like that was my that was my viewpoint going into this. Like, oh well, let's let's see what happened, and maybe we can learn some things from it. And then, um, <laughs> and then I get part way through the article, and I see this as part of their blog post update. System seventy six's principal engineer decided to chime in and make a fool of himself, so we banned the entire state of Colorado for life. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I see what's happening here. <laughs> um, suffice it to say, I think part of the problem here was the people running uh, Malabal uh, maybe are not quite um, <laughs> not quite as mature as they think they are. Um, but anyway, the the whole thing the whole thing is a mess. Like there were obvious problems when they were trying to make this happen. They they were paying money for it and did not get as much progress as they wanted to do as quick as they thought they should, and. Uh, then finally they, they sort of walked away from it, which is one thing, but then <laughs> they went and they complained. They, they aired their dirty laundry online, which, you know, is usually not a great idea. Um, you, you could have put out a much more professional. Now, as they say, as they say, yes, they could have put out a more professional um, statement about this, but it wouldn't have gotten nearly as much publicity. So... <laughs> I, I'll, I'll read from the closing here. If we would have said something to the effect of, mm -hmm, we felt the experience was unsatisfactory and thought they could have done a better job, it would not have conveyed the magnitude of the actual emotional distress that we were subjected to, <laughs> which can be proportionally measured in our response to ban their states and countries. Where was this all posted on? Uh, Malabell.com slash features slash don't support oh, on, the core boot project on their site. Okay. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got one link. Let me actually, I'll put the link to this particular, um, this particular blog post right in the uh, show notes. Um, yeah, not, but it's, not a good it's place hilarious. For that. Not a good place for that. I mean, those, those kinds of comments you need to post anonymously, anonymously on Facebook. That's where you do that kind of stuff. That's what it's there for. <laughs> Uh, no, no, <laughs> uh, the burner account yeah put it on facebook with the burner account uh yeah it's a it's hilarious it's kind of sad i, I think it was written somewhat tongue-in-cheek but at the same time it's just it's it's a it's an outpouring of things being um broken just put it that way things things are broken and this is what we get. <laughs> the internet is a hard place to hold your tongue. Uh, yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> not everybody is as grown up as they would like to think they are, too. I think that's I true. Know I'm that's not. what mute's for. Yeah, you know. 
all right, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, oh, Alma Linux. What is what is in the future of Alma Linux, Ken? Well, I'm going to ask uh, Christine Hall, Seth Kumar, Palini. I'm just going to call him SK from now on. And Bobby Borisov, they all wrote about Alma Linux OS developing a preview version of Alma Linux OS 10 aimed at providing the community with transparency and an early engagement in the development process. According to Christine, uh, the Alma Linux devs released Alma Linux OS Kitten. It's intended for downstream developers building off of Alma Linux. Now, Alma Linux chair and main spokesperson, Vinny Vasquez, didn't you uh, interview her on Floss Weekly? Uh, we did. We talked with Vinny. She's great. But she explained to Christine in a Zoom call, and I'm going to quote, Earlier this year, we noticed that CentOS Stream 10's code was available on the repos and was getting ready to be shipped. So we started building our pipeline, or excuse me, pipeline for Alma Linux 10, anticipating that next year Red Hat will release RHEL 10 based on CentOS Stream 10. Now, Christine explains the Alma devs can go ahead and start building their next version now. Knowing that when RHEL 10 comes out, they'll likely only need to make a few minor adjustments before pushing Alma Linux 10 out the door. The Alma folks also decided to go ahead and make the work they're doing now under the name Alma Linux OS Kitten 10 available to downstream developers instead of letting those developers twiddle the thumbs and waiting for Alma Linux 10 to be released. Now, Bobby explained in his article why Alma chose the code name Kitten. The name is a nod to Alma Linux's tradition of using cat theme code names. <laughs> so, much like a kitten grows into a cat, Alma Linux Kitten 10 will evolve into the final Alma Linux 10 release. All three touch on some of the key features and enhancements of Alma Linux OS Kitten 10. Uh, you, they're looking at adding Spice and KVM for IBM Power, continued RPM packaging for Firefox and Thunderbird, more hardware supported, re-enabling frame pointers, and support for older hardware. Now, you can for find more details on these features as well as other information that I haven't touched on in the respective articles from Christine, SK, and Bobby. I do have them linked to in our show notes. And I think, Jonathan, you may be seeing a kitten in your future. Oh, probably. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I was just looking before the show about Fedora 41, which, you know, that's a couple of versions beyond the RHEL 10 and, and Alma Linux 10 kitten. Uh, Fedora 41 is going to drop on tuesday i think and they just had the 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 go no go and got the got the poll to go on that um so you know definitely a terminal countdown for fedora 41 uh we'll ne definitely be talking about that next week but i'm sure i'll be running alma linux 10 on something before too much longer that's kind of where i that's kind of where i settled on my enterprise linux i'm doing a lot of alma linux these days so you may you may have a few clients trying it they probably won't know that they're trying it, but <laughs> at some point they will, yeah. For, I haven't really used either, but from a philosophical perspective, I like Alma. I, I've i said it before. I, I'm glad that both Alma Linux and Rocky Linux exist, um, but Alma Linux definitely seems to be the one that is, is uh, more popular at this point. Especially with being a clone. That's not really a clone. Not anymore. It's less of a clone. I, I think at this point you could say that Alma Linux is a clone of CentOS Stream more than CentOS itself. And Rocky Rocky's, Rocky's still trying to clone. Rocky is still trying to be a bug for bug clone of, of RHEL, yes. So a little, little bit of different uh, philosophy even in that between the two of them. So and that's kind of the that's kind of the point that you know when I first said that I'm glad both of them are there that's what I was getting at there's a little bit of room for them to experiment and go different directions and uh, time will tell which one is the way that works out. Yeah. And is Rob Sushinus? 
What? <laughs> Just command line. Too. Oh, oh um, goodness. Um, something yeah. like that. I, th- I thought maybe he was hissing like a snake. Um, oh. What is that? Rob, you want to take it away to talk about the first command line tip? What uh, is SS? And it's not the SS Minnow. <laughs> Which is yeah a Gilligan's <laughs> Island reference for those who uh, don't know that was the ship that they um, crashed onto the island with. Now, so SS is a uh, it's a socket tool to see what what sockets you have open, and I, I'm not going to show you every use case of it, but uh, let me just uh, flip my flip this over for those watching it. So. The main use case, I mean, you can just run SS and it's going to show you a whole bunch of stuff, um, which is a lot of stuff. And and for those watching, I am doing this on my pie hole, Uh, Ah. pie hole, which is a, a, a DNS with. DNS filtering for those who do not know, Uh, but I thought there could maybe be some interesting things here. So. But the main way I, I, I like to use it is SS space dash T U L N and dash T stands for TCP dash U is uh, UDP dash L is listening. So it shows the ports that are listening on this and dash N it's going to show the port numbers rather than the name. So if I do this and I did this earlier, as you can see, see those who know ports i guess maybe you don't all know ports you see port 53 there well my head's in the way so let me just scoot over here (laughs) port 53 that is the dns port obviously to be expected port 80 is the web port which um that's a non-secure http port which that's how you interface with the raspberry pi it's it's on my own home network not accessible to the public so it's okay that it's not https um and there's a a port 25 open which uh surprised me because that is um uh smtp so i don't know why smtp is open on my pie hole i'm I'm curious about that i'm going to look into that good thing i don't have this out on the internet or otherwise it could become an uh, a mail relay for people for spam um you know, just an example, if I remove that N, you could see what those are. A uh, domain meaning DNS, HTTP, uh, that 4711 there is, uh, it's, it's a, what's that called? <laughs> it's, it's something, something runs on port 4711. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it is. It's, it's not a default port in, 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 in the scheme of. Ports, that's the ports, that's the ephemeral. api that's the pi hole api that's the pi hole api oh oh yeah so i do have the api running i forgot because i i have an extension on my gnome which i can uh monitor and stuff mm-hmm. but uh i don't know if i ever showed that show some other time but uh also ssh i don't know if i, I mentioned that but port 22 so yeah. yeah so there are a bunch of other um things you can do that's how i like to do it I, I'm really curious why uh, um, port 25, why port 25 is open on there. But as you can see, if you do dash, dash so there's a, a, a bunch of different things. You know, you can resolve host names, uh, display all sockets, uh, a bunch of other things. You can, you can do only IPv4, IPv6. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Rob, pull that, pull that back up where you've got that list that shows port 25. Sure. Let's take a look at this. I think I think there's something real interesting here. And move your head. Move <laughs> Port 25 is listening on IPv4 and IPv6, but they're both bound to localhost. That's the 127.0.0.1 and the colon colon one. Oh, they're both yeah, bound yeah. to localhost, which means that it's not listening for anything from the outside of the machine. It is only listening internally. And I am pretty sure that Linux machines, just by default, all of them do internal mail and that is probably what that is well if you have if you have it running i checked others and i didn't have port 25 running but you don't necessarily have to have smtp even installed um 
so I must have installed. I suppose I think there is in Pihole. Um, you can I think you can maybe configure like alerts or reports or something in there. It's probably for sending out something like that. Yeah, probably. And so it's running an internal little SMTP daemon to do that. That makes a lot of sense. Which I'm not using that, so I guess I could just uh, I could uninstall that and mm-hmm. maybe we'll find out what gets broke. Oh well, yeah, hopefully it doesn't break. I could uninstall that, and since I'm running this on a very bare minimum virtual machine, I could have more resources, keep it running cleaner and slicker. <laughs> yep, but at the least, it is running. On, it is running only talking to local host. So yeah, good point. I didn't look at that too close because obviously, you know, it, it does show the IP that it's running on too, which I didn't mention that or the IP that it's listening on. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't mention that, but good point. Yeah. And so for those that are asking, Pi-hole is a way to, you you black hole certain DNS entries, usually relating to like advertising. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, it is a network wide ad blocker. So for example, mm-hmm. um, if you're on my network using that as, it's a DNS server. But it's the purpose, main purpose is to block ads. So even like if you have your phone on my Wi-Fi at my house, ads are going to get blocked on mm-hmm. games and stuff like that, which is probably Since one they're of the... not being rendered within a browser first. Yeah, it's one of the greatest features because phone games these days are, are terrible terrible ridiculous i go out somewhere my kids go out somewhere and they're like this game is unplayable (laughs) it's like i didn't even know i had all these ads in it but you could also also use it for your own dns so i have custom dns in there to point to various systems and machines around my house so i can uh call them by name so it's also also just a dns server i suppose you could even take out the blocking and just use it for dns but Probably. That's not exactly the purpose. Yeah. And then uh, since we're doing Q&A, Steve actually asks, why use a pie hole when you can just use an ad blocking DNS service? And I've got the answer for that one. Uh, the pie hole is not packaging up and selling your data. Whereas if you use yeah. an ad blocking DNS service, they are absolutely recording the DNS names that you look up and selling that. You collecting that information and selling it somewhere. And this... I mean, this is my... Even if you are paying for the service. Even if you are paying for the service. I mean, this is my service on my home network, so I can configure it any way I want. You know, mm-hmm. I can... I, I'm sure some... I know a lot of these services you can, especially if you're paying. You know, I can whitelist this. I can... Or I can block this. I can allow this. Um, I can configure it any way I want and monitor on my home. And, and also, it's nice as... To have it's nice to have dns on your own network mm-hmm. so that way it's basically like a proxy you know instead of reaching out to this place on the cloud every time i want to make a dns call it, it's just it goes to my own dns server it's like yeah i looked this up already uh, on some other device not long ago it's cached i'm not even gonna reach out to the internet here you go here's your here's your ip yeah um or you know you could um, redirect things as you want. You know, uh, if I want to um, have fun with uh, people in my house, I could redirect Google's IP to my own custom website and totally mess with them. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. I thought about it. I thought about having some fun like that, but I, I haven't. Um, I think yeah. HTTPS would probably uh, trip you up trying to pull that particular prank. Oh, yeah, the S would these days. <laughs> ah, modern technology. But uh <laughs> But yeah, plus I just like to have a DNS server. So if I'm going to have a DNS server on my house anyway to um, point things to my own services around my house, I might as well have an ad blocking one. Plus it it's like easier to set up than like bind or any DNS uh, solution like that. It's it, it's easy to set up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Web interface too, to to manage. Yeah, so um, I've got a command line tip that I ended up using just the other day. The, it's kind of funny the reason I needed it. So I, I bit torrented some things, and, uh, and of course, bit torrent it has legitimate uses. It's not just for pirating things. I went to download something with with KTorrent, and it just it wouldn't download for whatever reason. I, I was trying to feel like why 
like maybe the dot torrent file is corrupted or come to find out the problem was that I'd already downloaded it in the past. So it was already sitting in my download queue. And rather than tell me that K torrent was just silently failing. Um, anyway, so I went and I said, well, I don't want to install another full featured like graphical BitTorrent client. Surely there's a command line BitTorrent client. And there is, it's our torrent and it worked marvelously. And so just so you know, there is a BitTorrent client that works right on the command line, which, you know, if you're grabbing, say, an ISO on a remote machine that you don't have a full GUI on, you might really, this might be really, really useful. Um, so anyway, it's it's super simple to, re- to use. It's just our torrent and then either the torrent file or the torrent link, you know, the magnet link, and it will, it'll go grab the thing and... Uh, Uh, do the download now the only thing that you have to watch out for and this is something that i ran into is how do you get out of it it's kind of like vim uh it's hard to exit (laughs) it's hard to exit the program and uh apparently it is you can stop it with control d which you know that's another one of those uh Another one of those keyboard shortcuts that you should really you should really know. So whereas Control C is to cancel to, to to send a kill command essentially, Control D just sends a um, uh, an end of line um, signal actually, and so Control D to stop and Control Q to quit. So it is it is one of those programs that you might find yourself stuck in. Uh, I in fact when I was using it for real, when I got done using it, I actually opened up a new terminal and just killed it with the kill all command. <laughs> uh, but there it is, so our torrent. Three ways to close it. Uh, I mean, yeah, right, right, right. So you can either use Control Q, you can use kill all, or you can use the power button on the front of your computer, <laughs> <laughs> or just close the terminal window. Uh, maybe well, that doesn't it, always close things. Hmm. It's not always a window either. Sometimes you're in a TTY. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Anyway, I thought, I thought our or torrent was cool. Uh, Ken, you've got a, you've got a pipe wire tip for us, don't you? Yes. And the tip I have is going to show how you can find out what version of pipe wire you are currently running as well as uh, how you can change uh, some properties or uh, the configuration file that you're using. Now, I've got up on my screen what uh, the command. It's pipewire. Now, you can do either dash H or dash dash help, and it'll show the uh, help information, which will give you the options. In the case of my Ubuntu Studio, uh, it gives me uh, three options, one of which is the v- how to get the version. And this is the important one for everybody. Pipewire space dash dash version will let you find out what version of Pipewire you're running so you can see if you've got the latest and greatest. In the case of my Ubuntu Studio, it's compiled uh, with libpipewire 1.0.5. So Ubuntu Studio 2404 is currently using the 1.0x series. And I am going to quickly switch to uh, Tumbleweed. Uh, There we go. And here it's uh, running version.1.2.5. So I don't have 1.2.6 on it yet, even though I did do an update today. with. the 1.2.x series, it gives you a couple of other commands. One is a dash V for ver- or dash dash verbose. This will let you increase how much information or the verbosity by one level. You may specify multiple times to get even more information. This is the one that will let you do a dash capital P or dash dash properties where you can add given properties to uh, some of the uh, SPA or JSON objects uh, that you may need when you're doing other things with uh, Pipewire. And of course, the dash C or dash dash config will let you load uh, whatever config file. So if you've got multiple config files set up, you can use that to easily switch between them. And this may be the uh, first in a series of commands for managing Pipewire from the command line. 
because the link I've got attached in the show notes uh, will give you a, a, a GitHub link that gets you um, or takes you to docs.pipewire.org where you can see some of the other commands if you want to get a head start instead of waiting for me. And in our show notes, I've also got attached a link to the uh, Google document that's got these screenshots that I've been displaying up as well. All right. Very cool. Well, well the- what version of Pipewire do you have running? <laughs> I was just looking on my machines, and I've got uh, 1.2.0 on the desktop and 1.0.3 on the laptop. And uh, 1.3. Pop OS, right? Yeah, so 1.0.3. OS. Yes. Yeah, it probably needs an update. I haven't, I haven't run the updates in a while. It's my, uh, I don't do much web browsing on it, but it is the production machine, so I, I tend to just leave things when they're not breaking. <laughs> I have an off-topic question, Ken. Why? Okay. Why was there a video of me playing <laughs> in the background there? <laughs> I only know it was me because it was wearing my South Central shirt. <laughs> because I forgot to cut that out by doing this. Uh, <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> hey, look! It's I'll me. <laughs> yep. Uh, I used it to uh, resize the uh, my screen sh- cast <laughs> so that it wouldn't go over the uh, life of the feed tonight. But in the past, it was the uh, QR code. Uh, that's that's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, all right. Mm. Well, we have had our fun. We have covered our topics. We have hit our command line tips, and uh, we're now going to let the guys get the last word if they want to. We'll let Rob go first. You have anything you want to plug? Uh, I've got nothing special. Just my normal uh, call to come and connect with me. And um, why is my URL not on here like normal? Oh, here we go. I, I did the wrong one. There's the right one. <laughs> wrong scene. Um, <laughs> it would have worked. But here you go. You can can come find my information at robertpcampbell.com. And that information is uh, also, I think, on the, the show notes when they post it. I think there's a link to it, usually, I think. And when you come there, and that's if you don't know how to spell Campbell. Hopefully, you know how to spell Robert and P. Um, and it's just the letter P for those not watching. When you come to my website, you will find links on the top to my LinkedIn, my Twitter, my Mastodon, and a place to donate those 20, uh, 200, no, uh, who, however many coffees I need to, to get a, to get a X, uh, one elite. A uh, laptop. That that's where you do that. And you know, one of you doesn't have to donate all that for that laptop. You can, you know, split that up. If if every one of these listeners does one or two coffees, that's probably be enough. So I mean, just one coffee from everybody. Just one coffee from everybody a week <laughs> until Christmas. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all right, Ken. You have anything you want to plug? Uh, yes. Uh, this week. Former Floss Weekly uh, guest Christine Hall writes about the rebirth of the opensource.com community website idea as the All Things Open website under the name we love Open Source. They are sponsoring the All Things Open conference in Riley, North Carolina, where on Monday, Benny Vasquez will be talking on the state of Alma Linux. If you uh, are nearby, I'd recommend going to check it out. Jonathan, the All Things Open website may also be a good source for some of the future Floss Weekly guests. That could be interesting. I will definitely have to uh, check it out. Uh, Yep, definitely go check out the link I've got in the show notes about all that. Very cool. All right, thank you to each of you for being here. Um, I do quickly want to plug, of course, we've got Hackaday. It's where my security column goes live every Friday. That is also where you'll find the new home of Floss Weekly, and uh, we are super happy to be able to continue doing that. Um, 
Other than that, I just want to say thank you to everybody that watched us, those that got us live and those that get us on the download. We appreciate it. And we will see everybody next week on the Untitled Linux Show. Mm -hmm.